today. I feel like the Lord wants me to share this passage with you and then let us walk out of here with some ways that you can be a doer of God's word, okay? Uh, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if we read the word of God, but we do not listen and obey it? What good is it? Our heart should be this, that God help us to be obedient when we hear your word. Lord, Holy Spirit, help us to be obedient, change our lives, help us to be able to see things the way you do. But if we ever get to that point where we are blessed to see things the way God sees them, friends, we're not going to be able to stand still. We're not. It's going to require an act of obedience. It's going to have some ingredient of doing something with what God has shown us. So let's look at Micah chapter 6. It'll be up here on the screen if you want to turn into your Bible. You can. We're picking up two weeks ago where we left off studying through the book of Micah. So we're in Micah chapter 6 today. And I just love the timing of God's Word when you're just faithful to teach God's Word. Uh, We were having this special day. We knew it was on the calendar uh, that we would have Orphan Awareness Sunday um, they're like, okay, Lord, uh, we're in Micah. How's all that going to line up with this? Well, God's word is sovereign and his timing is sovereign. And uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 8 is where we're going to kind of land today. And you're going to see the relevance of where it connects with where we are today. So let's begin Micah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains. And let the hills hear your voice. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit, you mountains, and enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people, and he will argue it against Israel. My people, this is God talking, what have I done to you? Or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the place of slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam ahead of you. Verse 5, my people remember what Balak, king of Moab, proposed, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from the Achaean grove to Gilgal, so that you may acknowledge the Lord's righteous acts. What's happening here is God's confronting his people about their sin. They've walked away from God, and almost like a courtroom case, God is gathering the, the crowd together and saying, gathering the jury and saying, here, Hear my case, you mountains, you foundation. Now, it's very significant that he says mountains and foundations of the land because he goes back into his resume of his faithfulness. It was at Mount Sinai, a mountain, that God declared his covenant and his willingness to protect and watch over and lead these people. And so he's, he's, he's going back to physical markers of, hey, let me describe to you my faithfulness. And then he goes into the history of it in verses 4 and 5 when he asks the question, how have I wronged you, Israel? How have I wearied you? Tell me at any point in your relationship with me, have you not been able to trust me? How I have not come through for you? When have I wearied you? When can you find a fault? And so God goes on to say, because you've seen my deliverance when I took you out of Egypt. And by Moses and Aaron and Miriam, I led you out of captivity into the promised land. And before you got to the promised land, that the king was, uh, Balaam wanted to have a curse put on you, but Balaam couldn't do a curse, but God put in his mouth a blessing upon the people and a curse to all those who tried to offend or, or, or go against the nation of Israel. He says, do you remember that, Israel? Also, do you remember the time between this point and that point? That's when he's referring to Achaean Grove to Gilgal. Do you remember this point where I caused the streams and the rivers to dry up so that you could literally walk on dry ground across the promised land? Don't you remember my deliverance? Friend, when we walk away from God... It's because we forget the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we too are a people, and then when we stray away and we get our focus off God, it's because we forget what He's delivered us from. You were a people of slavery. You were a people without an inheritance, without a place. You were without a leader. And God said, I'll be your leader, and you'll be my people. 
And I'm going to break every chain and every power that's holding you back. And I'm going to free you through the precious blood of my son Jesus. And the power of his testimony of him rising from the grave. Where he has power over all things and authority over all things. And through his name's sake, you are delivered. How have I wronged you? You see, when we rebel against God and we walk away with God, it always comes back to us forgetting the character of God and who He is in our life. When I talk to someone who's struggling or walking away from God, I always ask this question, what is it about God you don't trust? What is it about God that you don't trust? Because your actions were decided based on what you don't trust God will do. That happened all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve didn't trust that God had their best interest at heart and chose the lie of the serpent. What is it about God that you don't trust? When we walk away from God, it's because we forget the greatness and the goodness of what God has delivered us from, church. That's why we come and that's why we gather and remind ourselves. That's why we as the church need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ every day. We need to be reminded of the faithfulness of God in our life. So he asks, what have I done wrong to you? And of course, they're speechless. They can't say anything. So Micah says this back in return, verse 6. What should I bring before the Lord when I come to bow before God on high? Basically, in light of God's faithfulness, what should I do? Should I come before him with burnt offerings, or with year-old calves? Verse 7. Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Or were 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? Micah is saying, okay, in light of God's faithfulness and greatness, in light of his great deliverance through all the generations and through all our time on earth, when we look at back at what God has been able to take us from and rescue us from ourselves and give us this abundant eternal life in him, what can I possibly give back in return? And so Micah goes back to some of the forms of worship back in their day. The worship of their own people where they would bring cattle, you know, and lambs and calves, and they would slaughter them for sacrifice. That was their form of worship. I believe he even brings up other countries of their feeble attempts to worship false gods when he talks about, do I even sacrifice the child, you know, for our own body? There were literally other pagan countries that would do stuff like that. But Micah's main expression was this, what do we possibly do in our day and time, what do we do to show our worship back to God? It's a good question for the American church today. American church, in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, what is our proper act of worship? How do we appropriately worship God it's tragic today in our society. You don't see this as much as, as I would see it as a ministry leader. There's like any, I guess, any occupation in our world, there's conferences that you go to. Some of you that are in a, a business setting or some type of leadership setting, there's all these conferences out there to help you be a better leader. Well, guess what? They even have conferences for these preachers, okay? Uh, and they got conferences for churches, and they'll, they'll, they'll be in cities like Orlando or Atlanta or other strategic parts of the United States. And they'll vote two to three days on how your church can be a better, more effective church in your community. And they will spend hours upon hours in some of these modern day conferences teaching you how to make Sunday morning matter. Where you hit a home run every Sunday. Live for big Sunday. All right, because your success is defined in how many people connect and keep coming back. And that's really their message. It's a message of numbers. It's a message of bells and whistles, lights and smoke, a delusion and deluding of the gospel, all in the name of gathering a crowd to show, hey, we are the people in town that can gather the most people to quote-unquote, worship God. But the Bible doesn't talk about smoke and lights. And it doesn't talk about projector screens. And it doesn't talk about coming in casual clothing or dressing in suits. It doesn't talk about 
if your worship service has the right air room temperature. It doesn't talk about whether you're using chairs or pews. It doesn't talk about did you do a doxology before or after. It doesn't talk about these things. That's not how worship's expressed. Mike is saying, in light of how awesome you have been in our life, how can we possibly express back to you our worship? And he gives the answer in verse 8. It says, verse 8, Mankind, he has told you what is good. Saying, man, guys, when he wrote out the law for you, he told you how to do this. He told you this is what your worship, your adoration, your adoring him, you loving him back would look like. Verse 8, Mankind, he has told you what is good and what is the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Some of your translations may say to seek justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. This is what worship will look like when we're overwhelmed by what God has delivered us from, from our bondage of sin and slavery. We will act justly. We will love faithfulness. And we will walk humbly with our God. So let's just leave that up on the screen because there's your outline for today. Okay? Isn't that awesome? When an outline can just be the scriptures. Amen? To act justly. How do I worship God? Well, Jesus Christ is in the business of reconciliation. He is in the business of restoring all things back to himself. Colossians 1 talks about how he is reconciling all the creation back to him in some form or fashion. It's coming back to him. Now, how we translate that might be some different opinions, but the reality is, is whether... It's the foe or the friend of God. It's all coming back to God's in charge. And God is to be worshipped. And Jesus Christ is to be reigning over all. And he's restoring that back. He's restoring back what has fallen. And he's bringing it back into his kingdom and his heaven with grace and truth and love. And so guys, I want you to take a little contemplation and and today just go back and Google maybe and research this but I want you to think about how many good things are established now in this world because the people of God joined God in what he was doing the first hospitals were created by the church the first schools were created by the church not the church as in you and me, but the church being that the thing they saw was the head, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. The darkest days, in my humble opinion, were the days before Jesus came out of the tomb. Because now, God is establishing His reign and rule everywhere and His glory is being made known. And we may not look at it. We may look at it with flesh eyes and say, this world's getting worse. But my friends, think about what this world would be like if the presence of God was not in it. It is God who first had the heart for the orphan. It was God who first established a heart for the fatherless. It is Jesus that gave a measure of respect beyond comprehension in his time to the woman in their culture. It was Jesus who started establishing and putting things back in right order. And so friends, when one of the byproducts of when we say we're a worshiper of God and we want to respond to God and what he's done for us, it's joining him in what he's doing to set things right in this world. Okay? The atheist will say... Where is God when these tragedies are happening? And Jesus is saying, where is my church? Because I'm there. Guys, when we worship Christ, 
then there's a desire to join him in righting the wrongs of this world. That is an expression of our worship. Number two, it says to love faithfulness. Your translation may say love mercy. Those go hand in hand in this verse, this passage. Love faithfulness. Love faithfulness. And what is that faithfulness built on? It's built on the mercy of God that God has given you. It's given on the fact that he chose to save you from your sin and self. And you're overwhelmed by that. So every day you have the intention and heart's desire, God, take more of my life than you had yesterday. Have more of me than you had yesterday. God, I'm continually being saved by your grace and mercy. Continue to have more of me. Faithfulness is not perfection. Faithfulness is pursuing the one who is perfect. Okay? You're not going to be perfect, church. But will your life be measured by the one, if you are pursuing perfection, are you pursuing Jesus? We can't join him in his work if we're not first going after him. Church, if your relationship with Christ is not priority, then you can't join him in the work of reconciliation. So we act justly. We love faithfulness. But number three, we walk humbly before our God. You can't join God in His work if you don't first want to be where God is. And you can't be where God is if you're not going to let Him be in charge. Walking humbly before God is saying, my rights are over, this life is yours, you are Lord. Friend, you want to worship God? Join Him in what He's doing. You want to worship God? You're not going to join Him unless you seek after Him. You want to worship God? You're not going to join Him unless you seek after Him, and you're not seeking after Him unless you're seeking Him in a mode and a manner where He is Lord and in charge. And the humility being expressed of your life is that I've made a mess of my life, so God, I'm giving it to you, and I just want to be with you. I yield myself to you. He don't want a lot of cattle. And I wonder if he would translate saying, y'all could sing a hundred songs to me. That's not what I'm wanting most. I'm wanting you walking out of here, joining me in what I'm doing. I want you to join me in it, not so that you can get the glory, but that, that you, can, you can know me better through the experience and you will glorify me. I want you to join me because you gave up your old life because I redeemed you from it and you're walking in a new life that I've created for you. That's how you worship me. So here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to take the last 20 minutes and I'm going to let you hear from two of your sisters in Christ that have been impacted by the Word of God who they would say, I'm not perfect at all. I have many failures, but I am faithfully trying to seek God's heart and follow God's heart in this. And God has now told them to come share this truth with us, how we can worship God even more and join Him in what He's doing. So we're going to talk to two of our members, Robbie Behan and Wendy Price. Please come up. They both serve on our Love the Least team. Love the Least, again, is a ministry devoted to help raising awareness and equipping the church to help the orphan epidemic that's going on around our world. And so today, they're going to share with you another outlet of how you can help impact the orphan. And we thank them for the last couple of years where they've shown us how you could adopt this past year, they showed us how we could, could be a part of foster care, and this church is now partnering with our, our foster care system uh, by not only having people signing up for foster care, but they're also the bags that we give to help with these kids. We appreciate this. So we're asking now, again, to listen as our sisters in Christ equip us with how we can be a part of what God is doing, and we can worship God even more, okay? We can join God in something God's in, okay? So let's welcome them. Let's give it up for them, okay? And once again, I left my questions on the seat there. So let me have those. Thank you. 
This is Robbie, and Wendy's right here next to me. So, uh, Robbie, we're going to start with you. Uh, tell me, uh, we're talking about fair trade today in the fair trade industry. Uh, what is fair trade? Tell us about that. Um, it would be impossible to describe everything there is to know about fair trade in a multitude of services. Um, I like to begin with the very basics, and um, all of you who are in first or second or third or fourth or fifth grade, I am certain at some point in time in school you've traded something. You've traded something with a friend. And if you got a new iPad for Christmas, and one of your friends said, would you trade me that iPad for this Matchbox car? You wouldn't do that you would say that's not fair. And fair trade is about making things fair. Um, trade, as we know it, is the buying of selling of goods. So traditional trade, what we normally do when we go into the supermarket or, or the clothing store, buying and selling, the bottom line is how much profit can I make? And sometimes that profit, oftentimes that profit is made at the expense of others. So fair trade has been established to help people in disadvantaged communities to make a fair wage, a wage that they can sustain their families in order to live above the poverty level. Um, and disadvantaged does not just mean poverty as we know it, but it can mean people in areas where there's human trafficking or orphans or disabled people. But um, fair trade exists in the United States in some of the poor, uh, poor communities. There are some fair trade organizations there, but the majority of the fair trade organizations are from other places around the world. I like to say that fair trade is um, like the, the almost a cliche, um, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for life. Yeah. And the, one of the purposes of fair trade is to help these people develop their own businesses, take the skills they have and use them to make a living rather than just giving to them, giving them a way to be successful. And there are 10 principles of fair trade and you can find that information if you want to at um, the Fair Trade Federation website. Fair wages is the most commonly known. Another component is community development. And another component we'll talk more about later is freedom from child labor. Um, you mentioned some terminologies we have on the screen here, uh, some definitions that sometimes we don't really understand and get, uh, have some misunderstandings to them. So, Wendy, uh, dealing with fair trade, talk to us about some of these definitions that go along with the fair trade process. Okay, Robbie just told you about fair trade. Um, forced labor is just another term for slavery. Sustainable income is income that be, can be counted on for the long term. So it doesn't mean that they just do something one time, they get paid for it one time. It's that they can do it over and over and over and get paid for it over and over and over. Free trade is not the same thing as fair trade, so don't get those confused. Totally different. And poverty is having little to no money mean, or means of support, but it goes so much beyond money. Um, we just think of money when we hear poverty, but it, it means that you um, you don't have money and therefore you are housing poor. You don't have a house. You are education poor because you don't have the money to go to school. You are um, health care poor. You can't afford to go to the doctor. Um, and Chris said earlier that it, it leads to um, even a feeling of emotional, you're not as good as other people. Um, there's a mental aspect to it that it's just your, your overall who you are. You feel like you're not good enough. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Robbie, what got you interested um, and perked your interest about free trade? I mean, free, I'm sorry, fair trade. Sorry, I was listening. Fair trade. <laughs> I, um, the Lord has always given me a heart for people in need. Um, as a child, my mama taught me to make friends with the kid on the playground who didn't have any friends. Um, I 
don't have a super competitive spirit. I shared in the first service, my son Brandon played football, and when he sacked the quarterback, I would be so excited, but then I would say, oh, that poor baby, I wonder how his mom is feeling right now. <laughs> and I still do that in a runaway game. Um, and most of you know, I have four children adopted from China. Um, I also have an adult child who is adopted. In my travels to China, I saw, of course, people in poverty. Um, some fair trade movements work with people with disabilities. And um, the hardest thing for me to see in China was the people with disabilities laying on the streets begging and um, when I, when we were adopting Ellie and walking the streets with her in the, the province where she was from, there were a lot of beggars near our hotel. And knowing that um, if Ellie had not come home to us, that would have been the life that she would have had. Um, I, I've shared before that I've been to South Africa doing mission work and um, Josie Tatum went with me, but the reverse is actually true. Josie Tatum took me with her heart for orphans. And while we were there, when we would, we bought some things from people on the side of the road in the village and in the markets. And I would, I was just thinking, wouldn't it be really neat if we could help these people market their things and help them to do better and maybe even use that to fund more mission work, to fund the work that we were there doing with orphans. And, um, this year, this past year, I chose to retire as an educator. 30 years, praise the Lord, no more. Um, and um, we knew, we still have four children at home, and Scott knew, I knew that I would have to do something to supplement the income. And I had a lot of ideas. Fair, opening a fair trade store was not on the list. And all I can say, we were in the middle of experiencing God, and all I can say is it was the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was packing a lunch for a picnic when I said, hey, Scott, I know what I want to do. I want to open a fair trade store just out of nowhere. And um, as I searched through Experiencing God and every, so many pages, I, I talked with Cammie's mom after the first service and, and things God has spoken to us. And I've got notes all in that book about how God would affirm what the decisions we were making as a family. But um, I came across this verse in Jeremiah 22:16, For he defended the cause of the poor and needy, and all went well with him. But the best part of that verse says, Is this not what it means to know me, Amen. declares the Lord. I had gone through experiencing God because I wanted to experience more of him. I wanted to draw closer to him. And here is God telling us, this is how you know who I am. You defend the cause of the poor and needy. And that is the, the Bible verse for our store. And that is our desire to continue to do that with, with the Lord's help. I, folks, I hope you hear, hear, heard what she just said there. The way that she was able to experience God was joining him in what he's doing. Okay, And, and, and you're, you see the heart of God when you get a part of ministries like this. Robbie, share with us some of your favorite organizations that you're able to join God in what he's doing. Uh, these ministries are always kind of the outward sign of God's hands. These are the hands and feet. So tell us a little bit about these ministries that you've been able to join God with. One of the principles of fair trade is community involvement. And I try, for our store, I try to choose products that I like, but that I can also be passionate about their community involvement piece. And so one of those up there, Miss Glenda Peacock, she's not a peacock anymore. Look how tired and crazy I am. Miss Glenda Aldridge <laughs> um, connected me with these people because she and um, Johnny have met them and, and done work there, but they do work in Haiti and we all know the poverty that is in Haiti brought upon by all the slaves left behind after slavery was abolished and the hurricanes and the earthquakes. And they work to help the people in Haiti to develop their own businesses and then to provide a market for the things they make. And I met one of, um, I, they're in Waynesville, they're in Brantley County, interestingly enough. 
and I talked with Adam Peltier. He works with them, and he shared with me. He came from the business world, and he shared with me the total mindset, the total change he had to make. Because in, in the business world, when he was working, he would have tens of thousands of dollars in a budget for a project. And he would approach somebody, and he would know in his mind that he could spend $40,000. And he would ask them, How, what, what can you do this project for? And they would come back with a bid of 35. But in the business world, the bottom line being making money, then he would turn around and say, but can you do it for 30? Whereas in, with, with um, the work in Haiti, somebody approaches them and says, I have a basket. Will you buy it? Will you give me a dollar for this basket? And they say, how long did it take you to make that? And, and the person might say, it took me two days. And then they say, no, I can't pay you a dollar for that. And they're teaching the people how to ask the right price for the work that they do right, yeah. and creating a market for them. And, and they will bring them some things to try to sell that nobody's going to want. So then they teach them, how can you take that and create a product that we can help you market and you, we can sell? Um, Dignity Designs this is another one of my favorites. They have beautiful jewelry. It is so well made. But my heart is there because um, the neighboring mission is Hashima Children's Center, and they have a school for children with disabilities. In Kenya, there is no special education. Children with special needs don't get to go to school. So this, this ministry is there providing free of charge the education for the children, but next door, Dignity Designs, they only employ the mothers of children in the school and they allow the mothers to earn an income with dignity. Rather than fully support the family, they give the mothers dignity. And there are several others. One we have um, you, from Uganda is Shoes, and they um, employ girls who are showing academic promise but wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to afford to go to college. And we'll talk more about some chocolate that, that, and coffee and other things, okay. but um, that's the community involvement piece that's also important. Um, that is neat to see these, you know, being the hands and feet. Uh, a couple of years ago, y'all challenged our church about on Orphan Awareness Sunday about adopting. Um, then last year, y'all built on the theme of foster care, that that was another avenue, you know, of helping the orphan or those without parents. So how does, talking about fair trade today, how does that connect back with Orphan Sunday and the calls for orphans? When um, Scott and I first embarked on the fair trade journey, I knew um, a drop in the bucket and still there's so much to know, but the more you research, the more you realize all of these social crises in the world are interrelated, poverty, and AIDS and human trafficking. And so um, as I've done a lot of research and I'll throw a few statistics at you and you can do your own. I, I'm one who likes to know how did you know that? And so Serve the Children is a good place to go for information and UNICEF is another good place to go for, for information. But um, poverty is known to be one of the leading factors of the orphan crisis. And, um, statistics show, it depends on which organizations get in the statistic, but nearly 150 million orphans in the world and poverty being one of the leading causes. And in some countries, it is the leading cause. If we can help these people to create businesses, to be paid fairly, they can afford to care for their own children and, and they won't be orphans. Um, Another part of fair trade is um, you're free from child labor. And um, research also shows that orphans are subjected to the very worst forms of child labor in the world. And another statistic I didn't know until we started planning for this presentation is that 94% of orphans live in developing countries. And that really hit home with me that if we can do something to help the economy in those countries and those people, then we can help eliminate some of the issues with, with orphans. Very good, very good. Um, so Wendy, I want to come back to you now and, and you kind of share with us how we all can be a part because one thing that excites me about this year 
every year has excited me, but I think God doesn't call everybody to everything. You know, like we didn't anticipate two years ago that 200 people would all go out there and adopt a child, okay? Uh, we didn't anticipate that everybody would do foster care because not everybody's in a position to do those things. But this year's a little different. Everybody has an opportunity to be a part of this, okay? You can do t something tangibly beyond just praying, but you can be a part. So tell us some more about um, how we can be a part as Bridge. Okay, if you look at your handout, you'll see that all these logos are on there. When you're at the store, just look for the logo, and that means that it's fair trade certified. Um, it may cost you a little extra, but it's worth it. Um, you can also look for things that are made in America if you can't find a fair trade certified product because we don't really have a problem with slavery here in America, thank the Lord. Um, and try to avoid places that are known to use human trafficking and slavery, places like India, China, Bangladesh. Um, they're just real hot spots for not paying people and slavery in general. So there's also some apps that you can get. Um, smartphone app Shop Ethical and Fair Fashion are two really good ones. Shop Ethical is a good app. It um, will let you look things up either by a category or by a barcode. And so on this one, I looked up my iPhone, and it's ranked A through F. So it's just like school. A is good, F is bad. My iPhone got a C, and you can see why they um, use Basically, they use slavery in China. Their workers in China are not paid a fair wage. Um, the good news about all of this is that when you become aware, your choices make companies make better decisions. So Apple is doing better now. I actually think they're up to about a B because they have made some changes in their supply chain. Um, you can also scan barcodes in this app. So I looked in my refrigerator and I found some Hershey syrup. And it's not good news. Hershey's got an F. Um, you see Reese's chocolate got an F. Um, chocolate is a huge industry that uses slavery, child labor mostly. Most of our chocolate comes from um, Africa, from the Ivory Coast or from Ghana. And children um, as young as like five and six years old are forced to work 14 and 16 hours a day. They um, have a quota of cocoa beans that they have to pick, and if they don't meet their quota, they're beaten. They're not allowed to go to school. Um, it's terrible the way they treat those children. And then we bring our chocolate home and enjoy it with no clue that that's where it came from. So now you know, okay? We're going to give you a piece of chocolate when you leave today. When you walk out the door, you'll get a little piece of chocolate. It's fair trade chocolate. It actually came from... Robbie's store, but you can also buy fair trade chocolate um, at Kroger. I've seen it, and there's probably some at Walmart. You just have to look for the logo, okay? And we're going to give you that piece of chocolate because we all like chocolate, and this is something that you can make a difference when you go to the store, okay? Look for the logo. Wow. Okay? Um. There's also a website called um, slaveryfootprint.org. You'll answer questions. It'll ask you how many rooms are in your house, how many phones you have, how many cars you have, um, your children, what toys your children have. Um, and then it'll use data based on your answers to tell you how many slaves worked to make the stuff that you own. Um, this is the results for Oliver and I. 43 slaves worked to make the things that we own. One is too many. Um, it's very eye-opening and it's sad. It makes you look around and think, did I really need that? You know, I didn't really need to buy it to begin with and now to know that a slave made it, it just makes you want to make better choices for sure. So try out that website. It's very interesting, eye-opening. Um, Robbie, tell us this. Uh, these are tangible things. Uh, that we could do something. We can walk out of here saying, I can do something. I can make a, a change for Jesus Christ, for his glory. What's the reality, though, if we... What's the reality if we don't do anything? What if we just walk out of here and do our regular religious rhetoric, say that was a good service, and we just do nothing with this? What, what's the reality of that? 
Um, that the picture that you see there is of a sweatshop, and um, the the more I learn, the more I realize that most of our name brand clothes are coming from sweatshops. Um, this morning I grabbed my fair trade purse and I had my fair trade wallet and put on my fair trade jewelry, but my jeans are Lee Riders and that company gets an F. And if you go through what um, Wendy's saying, the apps, you can also look online. Shop Ethical also has an online version. You can click and see the various reasons they've gotten, and it's, it's, it's usually more than one. The sweatshops, the refusal, the, the times they've been um, cited, and the refusal to do anything different about it. Um, you can do the next slide. Um, there, there are different pictures here. You see the technology on the right, and on the upper left is a, is a child working in the cocoa beans. And um, when you get home today for some light entertainment, you can look at YouTube. There's a documentary called The Dark Side of Chocolate. And until we, as consumers, change what we do, the big companies aren't going to change what they do. Wendy gave me some exciting news <laughs> between services. One of my favorite places to shop is Old Navy, and um, they have had an F, but 2016, there's been a recent change. I think now they have a C. But we try to save a few dollars here and there at, at the risk of what we're doing to others. Another big industry is the coffee industry, and um, I recently learned that coffee is the second largest commodity that we trade in the U.S., second only to oil. And um, a, an average coffee farmer earns $300 a year. The largest, um, the, the most popular brand of coffee in the United States is Folgers. And Folgers alone makes profits $1 billion a year. So when you buy fair trade coffee, it will cost you more, but it will be worth more in heaven. And chocolate, oh my goodness. But um, I, am, I've, I have found some more brands recently than the one that you're having, and, and I am learning to trade my favorites for something new. And I can't really enjoy Hershey or Nestle, all of the major coffee uh, chocolate companies in America use cocoa that is, is known to have slaves. So this morning, as we were singing Spirit of the Living God, I was just, you know, my prayer is that you take this and allow the Holy Spirit to change what you see and to change what you seek. Amen. Thank you all. Give it up for them, guys. I'm going to let the band walk on up here. Uh, I want to read this passage to you out of James chapter 2. Verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you don't give them that, what their body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works is dead by itself. Guys, we have not been called out of our sinful nature and slavery of bondage of sin to just be redeemed and rescued from that so that we could just sit and do nothing. God has called us to take the gospel and proclaim it to the nations. God's also called us to live out that gospel. Do you understand? It's not just proclaiming the gospel that Jesus saves you from your sins. It's People want to see what that looks like. And when we join God in what he's doing and, and, and righting our wrongs and, and righting the wrongs of this world, we're reconciling the world back to Christ. We're, we're experiencing what the gospel is proclaims. We, we join what God is doing. But if we just say here today, oh, yeah, we need to be mindful of that, but we do nothing, James says we really didn't have faith at all. So what's this going to look like today for you? 
This is kind of a, maybe an educational message today, more informative, but it still should call us to action. God says, this is what I desire. I desire of my people who worship me to act justly, to love faithfulness, to walk humbly with me. So what is the Holy Spirit going to tell you to do with this today? Now, friend, if you got Hershey's in your refrigerator right now, it's already been bought. You got me? I mean, God may tell you to do this, but I don't sense the compulsion to go to my refrigerator today and grab the Hershey's and throw it in the trash. But I do sense God saying, Chris, instead of living in this culture of busyness, where you just quickly go buy the, the, the cheap thing or the most catchy thing or the most popular thing, would you just love me enough to take the time to see what's behind this? Would I be willing next time when I go to the grocery store to study before I go? Why? Because I want to be a part of what God's doing. I love U.S. history. I love reading different things about U.S. history. And it amazes me when we go back to when slavery was ended in our country. There were men and women who God grabbed their heart. Their parents, their grandparents, they owned slaves. And there was a story of a man who just let God take over his heart. And he realized when he stood up against slavery, he was going to lose what he was advocating for. He was going to be advocating for bankruptcy in his own family because he would not be able to afford anybody to come work in his cotton fields and, and pick all that, all that. He wouldn't have the money to do that. And he was going to bankrupt his business. But he caught the heart of God. And he said, these treasures on earth are not worth comparing to the treasure of knowing Jesus and being with him. Slavery still goes along in this country, in, in this world. And, and you say it's not in our country. But yet, friends, if, if we walk out of here today because we're not ignorant anymore, and we say, oh, I'm not going to be mindful of this, <laughs> then, yeah, with one hand you gave some kids some toys, but in another hand you put a chain on the wrist. Do you get the hypocrisy? God has told us to come out of this world and to be a light to this world, to be salt and light to the earth and join Him in what He's doing. And God has the right to interrupt our agendas and our lives. Maybe you need to evaluate your career. Maybe you need to ask, Lord, are you getting me at a fork in the road where I need to now decide whether or not what I do for the rest of my life, if what I'm doing right now is really worth it. Or how can I make it worth it for your glory? Maybe it's not just your pocketbook. But guys, what we're saying today is we worship by responding to what God's moving and doing. And God's working in this world trying to establish and speak up for those that are dealing with injustice. And we have an opportunity to join Him in that. Now you say you're a follower of Jesus. Well, Jesus says, my followers are where I am. Will you join him? We're going to sing this song. And then our prayer for today is that we all walk out of here leaning on, asking the Spirit of God to direct us in tangible ways how we can be obedient to the needs that are going on in this world like this. So Ben, I'm going to ask you to lead us in this song. Jared, after it's over, I want you to close us in prayer. We'll be dismissed. But let's let God have the final word in your heart today about what you need to do in response to what you've been educated on. We love you. God bless you.